Yeah, thank you all for coming and welcome to the first seminar of this semester. Um, so today we have Kayla Grant um, from Champion uh, from Israel. So she's going to give a talk on subcranian crypto traction. So let's get started. Uh, so hi everyone and thanks for coming here and for this opportunity to share my work with you. Uh, I'm Dima Glantz, I'm a PhD student at the Technion in Israel, uh, where I work with Professor Falai Ferenc. And today I'll talk with you about stellar transients from interaction of triple uh, components. And oh. so first of all, why triples? So Apart from bringing uh, fun, challenge, and more interest to our life, uh, they can be very important because depending on the masses, they can be even more common than binary and single and single star. And they are also more likely to interact with each other uh, via mass transfer, as we will talk about the, uh, the case of, uh, of the common envelope, or other dynamical uh, interactions for example, the dual of cause and mechanism and so on. And we will begin with a case. I will, I will show you like two examples for, uh, for these cases. One of them is about the mass transfer, as I mentioned, uh, the common envelope evolution. And in particular, we'll talk about the common envelope of, uh, of a triple system. And first of all, let's talk about the general scenario of the common envelope in binary systems in general. So we know that when a star is a part of a binary or a multiple system, it evolves differently than if it was evolving in a way. Because uh, when two stars are close enough, they can transfer mass from one to the other by a rotation of overflow. And if this process is not stable for some reason, then both slopes can be filled up. And the shared envelope is formed, which is the common envelope. Now, this envelope covers both components, the two cores, or so the core of the giant and the compact companion, which then spirals in due to the dynamical friction from the gas, deeper and deeper inside the envelope, and the envelope expands in order to conserve the angular momentum that was lost from the orbit. And we believe that the common envelope phase has an important role in the evolution of many binary and multiple systems, and I have listed some examples here. And the reason that we believe that these systems that went through the common envelope phase is that if we follow the single stellar evolution, at least one of the components in those systems should have once been much larger than their current observed distance, which means that one, there should have been some migration process that brought them closer to, to each other. And secondly, this envelope should have been evaporated. So this is the purpose of the common envelope. And we can divide this into three main stages. The two first ones are happening on a dynamical time scale, and these are the formation and the fast plunging of the companion. And then we have a longer time scale uh, phase which might happen in which eventually the entire envelope should be ejected away. Now, the common envelope is most likely derived by the evolutionary growth of one of the components. So, during one of its giant phases, the primary or the donor star grows to a radius which is large enough to fill its draw flow and transfer mass to the companion uh, or the accretion. And now, if this process is not stable for some reason, if the, if the mass transfer rate is too high to be agreed upon to the companion, or the, uh, the angular momentum is too high, then the system is unable to synchronize the motion of the two cores and the gas and the gas envelope. And this leads to the next unstable stage, which is the uh, fast spiraling phase, in which then both cores are uh, spiraling deeper and deeper closer to each other, they might merge at the end or just remain in a short period of it, and the envelope might be ejected away. 
Now, if the envelope has not yet been completely unbounded, there might be another phase, a uh, longer time scale in which, due to some fallbacks of this remaining material, the common envelope phase might happen all over again. Or there may be other physical processes that evolve that can push the envelope outwards until eventually it should all be ejected away. And the reason that it must be ejected away again is that its remaining will cause the mutual merger of any post common envelope binaries. But we do observe such survivors. At the end, we will be left with either a short or a shorter period uh, binary consisted of the remnant core, the y core for SDD star, and the companion, or with a single star that was formed from the merger of the two components and uh, what remained bounded from the envelope. And the ejected gas will be somewhere around the system and bounded as a planetary nebula. Now, uh, for one of the best parts of my uh, presentation, which is a movie, let's see an example. So, this is a binary common envelope evolution of eight solar mass red giant with two solar mass companions, initially located at a distance which is twice the size of the time. So, one, we can, now we can see how the tidal uh, forces create this profitable overflow, and now we have the common envelope phase, and the fast spiraling begins. And we can also identify these density wakes due to the transfer of energy uh, to the envelope uh, due to the dynamic of friction, and they get closer and closer to each other until, in this specific case, they actually emerge. And a bit about the observation. So what happens in this problem what, what is was that, that this was a hydro simulation. Or? Yes, it was a hydro simulation. Mm -hmm. It's a 3D SPH uh, simulation that I will later on talk about. Um, yeah, please interrupt me at any moment if you, if you ask me. Um, so briefly about observation of this case, and the, the problem with the common envelope. One of the problem is that it's very possible to observe the spiraling phase while it's happening because the energy is not high enough and it's happening on a very short time scale. So therefore, we have to somehow um, study about this gap between the, what we think we think are pre-common envelope system and post-common envelope system and somehow learn about this gap only by doing hydro simulations and create our theories. So now back to triple, so we can find many previous works suggesting that a large variety of observed systems are results of common envelope and triple system. But no one has previously simulated uh, this scenario in a full hydrodynamical simulation due to computational difficulties, in addition to the fact that, as I mentioned, we are far from understanding the simpler case of common envelope in binary but it is still very important to even get a clue of the general effect of this uh, phase on the evolution of the system, the uh, differences from the binary case, and to be able to predict the possible outcomes. In general, we'll still have a giant that should eject the envelope and then continue <coughs> that to spiral in closer to its core. Um, but now, we have, instead of only one uh, orbital energy and actual momentum that can be transferred to push the envelope outward, we actually have two. So we have the outer orbit and then the inner orbit from the second. Um, and if we look at the parameter state, uh, the parameter phase, we have the multiplicity of the secondary insert, many more uh, configuration at the onset of the common envelope. So the inner separation, eccentricity, inclination, and of course the extra binding energy. So we can therefore expect to have many more possible outcomes than in the, in the binary case. And we can divide the 
triple common end block scenario into two main configurations. The first one, which I will mostly talk about today, is the circumstellar case in which we have a giant, which is our uh, primary star, and this is the tertiary in this uh, configuration, and it has an inner binary system as its companion. And it has an, and we call it the inner binary due to its electron motion inside the envelope. And it has an inner separation, eccentricity, and so on. And its center of mass forms another, um, another binary system together with the giant. So we can look at this configuration as if we took the binary common envelope phase and we have split it. The uh, companion into a binary system of its own. This is also from simulation. And the second scenario is the synchronous binary triple, in which we have a binary system that is going through a common envelope phase, but it now has a tertiary, a longer distance triple companion. And when this envelope will expand due to the common envelope phase, it may engulf the tertiary, and then we'll have another interesting scenario of triple common envelope. So this is from uh, an old simulation, and this is from our preliminary results that I hope to show you today. And I should also mention that even in cases that the, the tertiary is not being engulfed in the envelope, because it's not participating in the triple common envelope, it existence can still affect the binary common envelope itself because it can lead to change of the orbital parameter of this binary system and to things like an eccentric configuration of the system upon onset of this common envelope, which is also something that we studied and you are welcome to uh, read our paper. So how we did the simulation? Um, this is for the circumstellar case. So we ran everything by a fused framework that allows us to combine main codes together in the same simulation in a fluid way. We use uh, the stellar evolution code MESA to evolve our time, and then we converted it into a 3D SPH code to be used with Gadget 2. And then after a relaxation stage, we coupled this code together with two other codes for a better accuracy of the motion of the inner binary. And uh, I mentioned that we ran a grid of simulations to test these correlations between the initial configurations of the system and the final. So now another movie. So this is the same system from the first movie, but now we have a three ball system. So it's again uh, an eight solar mass ray giant. And now we have the inner binary consisted of each, uh, each component has one solar mass. And uh, initially, their center of mass is located at the DC, which is twice the size of a giant. Um, here, the inclination is zero. And the separation is 26 solar radii, which makes an initially stable triple system. But its binding energy is not large enough to overcome the tidal forces now when they're coming back, uh, uh, well, getting closer to the stellar core. And it's being disrupted, as we now see. And at the end, one of the components here still merges with the core, but the other ones remain in a longer period of it. So one could notice that this movie was much longer than the previous one. And this is, of course, due to the extra uh, energy and angular momentum coming from the extra binary system. Uh, that leads to a more efficient delusion of the envelope and therefore um, uh, lead to a longer duration and, and larger mass ejection. We can look here at the separation between the uh, center of mass of the, of the binary and the uh, uh, versus star. And the, the first system from the, from the binary is in, uh, in green, in, uh, sorry, yeah, in yellow. And the triple system that we just saw in blue, and we see that the separation is indeed longer, it actually took more time to begin the plant in. And we can compare this system with another triple system in which the compact binary, the inner binary, is even more compact than that 
has uh, an even larger binding energy and extra energy to the system. And its duration is indeed longer, and we found that the mass ejection was more efficient and was higher. And we talked about the uh, two energies coming from the two orbits, so we can look here at this competition or phase between uh, the outer orbit or the shrinker of the, the shrinkage of the outer orbit and the inner orbit in, uh, in Martin in lively colors. And as we saw in the movie now, the inner binary got disrupted before the end of the prominent block. But in this triple system where the inner binary was more compact, it actually merged before the end. And we can also look at how more efficient the ejection is for uh, more compact inner binaries in these plots. So what we see here is the gravitational force acting on the inner binary and the surrounding density. And here is the same plot of the separation. And as we can see here, um, so while it's getting closer to the stellar core, where uh, the, the, the gravitational force increases, it's the minus sign, it decreases, and then because it dilutes very efficiently, it, it, it decreases again, and then again it's, it's increasing because it's got disrupted and they both just dive in very, very close to the core. But in the other system in which the uh, inner binary is more compact, the dilution is super good. And then the uh, gravitational force rapidly decreases. And then only slowly, slowly it can, uh, it can uh, continue its plunging towards the center of the star. And here we can see how the uh, energy and angular momentum are transferred from the orbit in red to the gas. Do you also efficiently measure gas drag of the system, or um, is it mainly that you look at the overall energy redistribution? Or like? Yeah, it will be good. Yeah, Th but this is what they checked so the gravitational force. Um, but yeah, that's something that we can evaluate. Uh, we will talk a bit more about the gas dynamic transmission or the other scenario of the typical um, So what we see here is different configurations of the inner binary. So we took different separation and we saw that more compact inner binaries tend to merge before the end of the component block, whereas uh, those with larger separation somehow get uh, sometimes get disrupted. And of course, more compact also leads to longer duration and larger amount of mass ejection. And we can also see how the inclination changes. So this is larger inclination than this point. And but this is a bit unfair because if you take a larger inclination, if you take zero inclination, it means that one of the components is initially located closer to the stellar core. So it's a bit unfair. How do you fix the initial eccentricity? Sorry? The initial eccentricity of the, of the orbit. Like, is that a free parameter? Is that like yes, a I, or did you just say? I mean, it's, it's, a, a, it's a hydro simulation. So, in these cases, I always do an initial uh, circular orbit for all the systems. Because your orbit is definitely eccentric, right? So, yeah. So, what, what we see here is the separation uh -huh. with the one of the components. And the core. So that's why you see these oscillations, right? Because you also have the inner motion. And of course, the triple interaction leads to an increase of the eccentricity. And especially here, when the plunging in starts, then you get an eccentric core, which is the plunging. So the amplitude of these oscillations is not the eccentricity, it's just the orbital separation of the inner binary. It's both, but yes. I mean, you can see the amplitude. So you have one which is the outer orbit, right? And one which is the inner. Now, if we want to look at the ejection or the morphology of, uh, morphology of the ejection, so in the binary case, it was pretty much axis in the frequency, and we were seeing even better 
this case uh, dependent in the short period orbit and not in the merger. And it looks like in, in the slice plot, it looks like a bow tie is actually exposed. But in the triple case, it was all messy and looked quite similar to this messy planetary nebula that we were unable to explain. I should also mention that, of course, that uh, there is a longer time scale uh, evolution of the system. This is not, I mean, my uh, last effort is not the really what we will set, but still it gives us some to general effect. And overall, in this project, we tested 13 different configurations of the system, and each of them gave, gave us a completely different outcome. Which means that the triple component will need a strong template to expect the formation of many, uh, many systems. But I should also mention that I stopped the simulation when I identified that a merger should happen. And I modeled the cores, all of them, as point masses. So I couldn't really follow the merger that happened inside the envelope. But depending on the nature of these components, this can be very interesting to actually see what happens there, and it will be important to actually continue this simulation. We can get like sort of exotic explosions inside this uh, gigantic envelope, which will be very interesting. Uh, but of course, it's a harder computation. Now we move back to the second scenario of the triple common envelope. This is a prelim preliminary result. Uh, and I worked on this with Sylvia Chunan and Fritz Putke. Um, and what we wanted to see here, so we have a binary common envelope happening, and it has a third this more distant companion. And what we wanted to see if this scenario is actually possible. If it's possible that this common envelope will engulf the tertiary and lead to a migration in the um, so we have an initial, we want to have an initially stable triple configuration, a radical triple, then a binary common envelope in the inner binary, and then, yeah, and then we want to have uh, an endowment of the third triple. And we wanted to focus only on the two last stages. So we wanted to use a previous binary simulation that we have of a common envelope to save time because it's going to be expensive anyway. Um, so that's why we wanted to take a system that's experiencing a common envelope, a binary common envelope evolution, stop at some point uh, before the interaction with the tertiary begins, and only then start the evolution of the triple system. And what we did was we took a binary common envelope simulation from the fruit Facebook. So the, uh, all of the configuration of this binary is from, from that simulation. And then we calculated with the population synthesis code for triples for stress that Sylvia Tunan is developing. We took the, uh, the mass that is most likely for the tertiary to lead to uh, a common envelope. And then we place the tertiary in such a place that makes uh, it initially in initially a uh, stable triple system, but uh, it's also not too far away, so such that we know that when this envelope will expand, it can lead to another Roche lobe overflow with a new uh, That's it. Overall, the flow is pretty much similar to what we did before, but now we don't, uh, we don't use abuse, and instead of gadget to use a red code, which is a moving mesh code, and it allows us for a much better resolution in the places that we actually need, which is not where most of the mass is, but actually where the companion or the tertiary here is located, uh, when where actually the density is very low. And uh, we also included the opal equation of state and not the ideal gas equation of state. Uh, and this allows us to account for recombination effect and we potentially eject for uh, more material from the system. So it also means that we cannot really compare between the two scenarios that we tested because of the difference in the code. Do you need a composition tracer for that one? 
um, depends what I want to do. I did not use it, but but it really depends what I want to do. Yeah. Okay, so let's see how it looks like. So what I wanted to see, I remind you, is to see if, if, if it's possible to actually engulf the territory. So I wanted to see some evidence for the gas dynamic operation. So I looked at the density and then also the velocity. So in the density, I wanted to see some kind of a tail, a backward tail in the opposite direction of motion. And in the velocity, so I was worried, we were worried that uh, because of the ejection, of the very efficient ejection due to the recombination, what we will get is that the velocity from these winds, from the binary common envelope, will be too high such that instead of actually uh, engulfing the tertiary and causing a migration inwards, it will actually hit it and push it away. So that's why we also look at the velocity. You can now see, or before you can see some kind of a rotational overflow here, so something that reminds us this, but it's not that clear. We can see that the tertiary uh, took a lot of mass with it. But it's still not that clear if we see a migration here or not. So let's see uh, the separation. So what we see here, this is the separation between the tertiary and the giant core, and the other one is uh, between the tertiary and the center of mass of the inner binary. And we can see that after a very, very long time, after we all were, almost gave up on this simulation and decided that, OK, that's not possible, uh, the, the orbit changed and became more eccentric and then the pericenter actually decreased and also the centimeter axis only by a bit, but we still got an engulfment and a migration in So it's a bit tri trickier, but it's still possible to get this scenario of, uh, of a triple common and binary uh, case. And now, so I, I promised I'll talk about transients a bit. So uh, observations of the common and blocks. So I mentioned already that some of the problems with this is that the energy that is ejected is not high enough compared to supernova, for example. So it's very high to be detected. And we also see that a lot of dust is forming during this process. We see this. Uh, both in our calculations and in, in actual observations of planetary nebula post common envelope system. And it obscures what we see. So it's very also it's also very hard to have to learn about the post common envelope systems. Another thing is that we don't really know what is the time scale of this ejection. Does it happen on a dynamical time scale of the plan in phase or maybe in a longer time scale? So these are still questions that we need to solve. And multiple things that people did before. So one is gravitational waves that are, I know for interest uh, for many of you. Um, what we found uh, in this paper led by Barry Inat is that, uh, so we calculated the, the uh, gravitational waves that will be produced due to uh, the merger inside a uh, common envelope in, in a binary system with pretty much low, uh, low mass stars. And we found out that it will be possible to be detected with ESA, but only for high mass stars. What they still need to, find, to, to, to check is what happens in cases of triple systems or centric systems or things that can actually maybe accelerate the, uh, the mergers. Another thing is luminous red, red novi that are um, observed right now and are uh, invest, investigated heavily. And this, so when the envelope expands and it can release some of the energy, the energy as photons, for example, from the recombination energy, and we, it can be detected. And some new sources that are thought to uh, be caused by the common envelope phase are the water fountains. And we hope as a community that now when we, uh, when 
many people that observe this kind of system and theoreticians talk that we can actually somehow solve more of the of the of this problem. And I'm very hopeful about that. So uh, back to, to triple system and the second scenario that uh, I promised you, uh, which happens to the dynamical evolution of the system. So uh, these are type 1As. So a brief introduction. Type 1As do not show any lines of hydrogens, uh, which make us think that they uh, are results of explosions of the generate object that has no kind of hydrogen envelope or hydrogen surrounding. And they all uh, pick around the same luminosity, which makes them a good uh, uh, way to measure distances from objects that we observe. But that, make, that means that we need to be very careful with how we treat them so we don't make mistakes because they are very important. And there are things that uh, to be caused by uh, is the generate object that reaches uh, the Chandrasekhar mass limit, in which is the generate pressure can no longer support its gravity, and that's why it explodes. But of course, as in everything in astrophysics, and I think in science in general, the exact mechanism is still unknown. Um, so one of the uh, mechanisms that was suggested is a single degenerate scenario in which we have a single one, one object which is degenerate one white work and it is secreting from the surrounding or from another non degenerate component until it reaches the Chandrasekhar mass limit and explodes. In this case, uh, the secondary can survive, but it has some other limitation, for example, that it can explain only like 20% of the events of like one ace. The second scenario is the double degenerate scenario, which means that we have two white dwarfs interacting, and together they sum up to something which is more, which is above the Chandrasekhar mass limit. And of course, this one also has some limitations, but together they maybe can uh, somehow lead to all the effects we've seen. Now we talk uh, more about the double degenerate scenario. So it can be caused by the merger of the two. Works due to gravitational wave in spiral, for example, or uh, or mass transfer in the case of the common envelope, or it can also be caused by a direct collision, which is the example I'm going to talk about today. And we can find previous works that uh, suggested that type one A can be caused by the Hadron collision mostly, uh, of of two white works. Um, it, but it has, it has been thought to lead to the vast majority of the type 1A event from triple and quadruple interactions, but then later on, with population synthesis code, it was shown that it leads to no more land than like 1% of the events. But it's still important to investigate this uh, because we're going to observe them with LSST. And it can still teach us more about the physics that is behind this uh, explosion. Now, collisions with non-zero impact parameter can basically be even more common and can lead to different fraction of the physics production. Um, and that's what we wanted to, to check here. So what we wanted to do is to derive an analytical prescription to help us differ between the case of collision that leads to a, an explosion and no explosion. So then we can take this simplified analytical prescription, put this in a population synthesis code, and actually calculate the rates of this event. So first of all, an example. So this is the head of collision. Actually, it's not that important, but together they sum up to more and they turn to take a mass limit, and of course, we expect to have an explosion and see how it looks like. So, we see the density temperature, density of the nickel 56, and density of the silicon 28. So, we scan. So, we can see also how the shock propagates. So, basically, we have two, in this case, equal masses. 
white wolf, see a white wolf that move toward each other with a relative velocity. And now if we look at this, uh, this region of interaction, so this is the direct collision interaction, we call it the interaction uh, region. And then we take the maximum density along this region. And this density is the one that from the direct collision can be condensed into the highest density of the star. And then we want to see if it can be condensed to a density which is high enough to detonate the carbon. So we'll get larger density and larger temperature here. It can detonate the carbon, and this is the idea of how we should could be fair between an exponent and a knowledge exponent. That simulation, are you running this with the network? So does the thing self consistently detonate? Sorry, sorry. Can you... Are, you, are you running it with the network here? Like when you do the collision, does it self consistently detonate once you reach yes. the network? Yes, 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 yes. I will, will soon show you another uh, scheme of work. So basically, we have a, a shock produced by this collision, then it condenses the, the white dwarf and it leads to higher density and higher temperature, and we want to see if the new highest density and temperature reach are above the critical values for a carbon uh, detonation. And now if you look at the chakran Jugo diagram, we want to be in this region of the strong detonation, so we increase both density and, and the pressure. And if we take the asymptotic values to this region, then we can derive this uh, uh, relation between the initial density or initial highest density in the interaction region and the critical density for carbon detonation. And we can also follow the, um, uh, the shock. And from, from conservation of momentum and mass, we can also derive this formula to correlate between the initial relative velocity and the critical temperature for carbon detonation. And then we can plug in the values that we think are the values for carbon detonation. This is, of course, still a free parameter. We take this mostly from simulation and what we think, but this potentially in the population synthesis code, it can be a free parameter. Uh, and what, what I want you to remember is this value that we got from the density, so the 7.5 times to the fifth gram per cubic centimeters. And now you don't have to believe me, let's see uh, what we got from the simulation. So first, how we did that. Uh, so we evolved a white dwarf with MESA, then we converted it to a 3D repo model this time again. And after uh, relaxation in isolation, we created the binary uh, in the correct place with, uh, with the relative velocity that we wanted in the, in the, in the uh, initial impact parameter, and we ran the simulation. And we coupled this with the 50, 55 isotope networks, um, and we used the Gina reaction rate, and we also used some limiters for the in shock such that we don't allow uh, for uh, an artificially ignition due to numerical errors in a very tiny cell. And we ran this with different impact parameters from a head on collision with zero impact parameters to a case of phasing and with three different velocities from hypervelocity that can be uh, in the dense stellar regions around supermassive black holes, for example, to a free fall density. So we begin with a terminal velocity for the other. Okay, and now we see so we see the same system from the previous movie, but now we took an input parameter that gave us the highest density in the interaction region to be slightly below the threshold of the calculator. So what do you think will happen? No boom. No boom. Okay, that's what we hope. Let's see. Right, no boom. <laughs> uh, but if you could notice, there was some silicon formed here. 
So it was not a complete burning to nickel, but there was some zinc one form here. I will show you this one again. Yeah, a little bit. Um, which means that we are probably indeed close to the actual pressure. So we feel very happy with this result. And now we took another another system in which the input parameter is like 99% of the of the previous one, and it leads to a density which is slightly above the threshold that we calculated. So what we have been now? I think. It's exploded. Uh, and we can look at this again and see how the shock looks differently than in, than in the case of the tidal fluid. Um, so, this is the summary of the results. We can also see here how, the, how we account for the uh, changing the orbit due to the gravitation of focusing of the white body before they actually uh, collide. So they change the, the highest density in the interaction region and, and also the impact parameter um, and the, the impact velocity. And then we also calculated how much nickel was formed because we were hoping that maybe we can somehow correlate the different properties of the initial system to the amount of nickel 56 that was produced. Um, unfortunately, we cannot really tell from, from this result uh, any kind of correlation. Uh, interestingly, what we see is that for, for the hypervelocity cases, uh, the hadron collision led to a lot of nickel produced and it, and de it decreased with uh, uh, when we increased the impact parameter. But in the cases of the free fall, it was not really the case. So there is no really any kind of relation. So what happens here is that because it has some time of focusing, the shock is also expanding for a no zero impact parameter. So this can lead to formation of more nickel. So for, for those cases, it is about the square of around that meter equals the square of all. Yeah, so very good question because I have a oh. I have a <laughs> slide about this like one after this. Uh, so this one just shows us that how we the change of different limiters and configuration of the numerics affects the results. So that's also why we cannot really tell anything about the production of nickel from this, unfortunately. This is your slide. <laughs> uh, so again, I look at the last snapshots that I have uh, from, from some of the simulation. So this is the case of the head-on collision, the collision with the zero impact parameter, and it has some symmetry, as you can see. But the other one is not really. I mean, yeah, you can always see where the axis of collision probably was, but it has a different kind of symmetry indeed from the head-on collision. Now, this is a, a very nice plot. So what we see here is that uh, we created different models of CO white worms at NASA, and then we saw, then we wanted to see where the critical density that we calculated is located, uh, uh, in what distance it is from the from the center of the of the white worm. And as we see here, because of the opposite relation between the mass and the radius, it actually located pretty much at the same distance, which will make our life easier when we want to actually put this into the population synthesis. And I will leave you now with this slide of my previous and ongoing research. So to encourage you to come and talk with me, even if you're interested in different stuff uh, than what I uh, presented here. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, for the, the head-on collision, my intuition for this comes entirely from neutron star mergers, but yeah. also compare head-on with like grazing or or the difference, of course, the thing doesn't combust up. Yeah. But 
but is there like sort of some, some transition as you make the thing more circular? In principle, there should be, because if you, if you have very unequal mass mergers, the, the, the densities you reach in sort of this collision layer, the temperatures are very, very different. They can change by like orders, like factor 10 or something, so based on mass ratio or based on. You mean due to the, due to the interaction before, like the tidal of orders that? No, no, just right, right when they, when they touch. Like there's a, there's ah. a huge dependence on the thermodynamics whether you have like a mass ratio one or a mass ratio three, yeah. collision or mass ratio two, right? And then similar things also have been found, uh, like yeah, moderate yeah. eccentricity. Yeah, so in this work, we tested only the case of equal masses. So we have equal mm -hmm. models. But this is something that will be very important to actually investigate as well. So when we have different models, and then, I don't know, it can lead to many scenarios, right? One of them can explode, one can survive, or I don't know, one of them can be disrupted before. Or yeah. This is more complicated than something that we could easily make uh, the analytical yeah. version. Yeah. So that's why we did not. But that, that would be important, right? So, we have all of Korean, we're finding all these weird binaries that we need to explain. And some of them may have gone through stellar mergers or common envelopes. Do you think of new classes of weird binaries that maybe could be explained by some of these new old interactions? So as we what we found is that the GPO system are hardly surviving the thing of common envelope scenario. So most of the cases they just end with either an inner merger or a core merger or one of the components is completely ejected from the system. Uh, so we can get pretty much everything. And from this core merger, we can get like, things like foreign typical objects and things like that. Um, um, yeah, you can get pretty much to everything. So as I also mentioned, some explosions inside the gas um, X ray binaries, they become more compact. Um, yeah, but and this is really depends on the nature of the component. So, here what we did was we did not uh, account for this at all. We just modeled them as point masses and then we saw okay, we got an inner merger, a core merger, an injection, or with what velocity, whatever. But then uh, one of the components is a black hole or a neutron star, or things like that. It's not to be stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was going to ask you about the circumbinary case for the triple. Yeah. So there's this famous pulsar and a triple that you had on one of your slides, uh, where they they proposed without doing the calculation that mm -hmm. that's how you brought in the the outer star that yeah. formed out. Do you, do you think it's plot? It's, do, you, do you think that works quantitatively given your simulations? So actually, the simulations that you saw, the old one, way. So the old one that I showed was actually for this scenario because uh, when we published the first paper, uh, Thomas Tarvis was uh, contacted me and he said, "Okay, I actually think that this is the correct scenario to see if stellar is and not the same binary." Mm -hmm. So we wanted to take both uh, options. So depending on the mass, like if you take a larger, a higher mass of the giant, then the envelope is also uh, more expanded and, and more diluted, and then it can actually survive in some cases. Mm -hmm. So therefore, so this would, but this would be different than for low mass stars. Yes. So potentially, yes, both of the scenarios can lead to. Uh, to the surviving of, of the system. Getting the exact uh, properties that they uh, mentioned in the paper of the slab closer, it's a bit trickier, but yeah. Definitely we talked about this. Yes. I was curious, um, when it's ejecting, is that the same thing as the runaway? Or is that something? Or what did you have the envelope or the whiteboard? No, the whiteboard. 
Yeah. How common or rare is that? And is the tree still common in the case? Or in any form of uh, so you do see hypervelocity stars. You do see, you do observe them. So they need to come from something. So they do exist. I cannot really tell the debates, but they do exist. And this is one way to form them. I have a question. So, so when so people try to simulate binary by like they do the common envelope by like a simple alpha or alpha log of the outer array. Mm -hmm. So qualitatively, how do you expect those three parameters to change if there's like a terrible overlap? Would it increase or decrease or you have gone? Yeah, so as we did here for the for the collision, people do for, for the common envelope case, they, they just model the common envelope. Population synthesis model, as they get, they have a two, they have two, uh, three parameters, which is the efficiency of the transfer of mass from the orbital energy to the kinetic energy of the envelope. Then, if it's one, it's just like super efficient, or not super efficient, but it's just like all converted to a kinetic energy. If it's above one, it means that there are more forces involved, so it is super efficient, less than one. The entire envelope is less likely to be ejected, and they actually need to probably to be able to measure or something. Um, so what we wanted to do actually in the in the eccentric common envelope paper that we published, I wanted to calculate the alpha parameter, this efficiency that they are using for the different systems that we tested, and we saw that it's just not the same value. It was completely different, and there was like we also try to make like a feed or some plot of this and it just it just doesn't work. So what people are now suggesting that maybe you should also just divide the common envelope into the different stages and then use the different volume for each of the stages or something else. But at least from what I am finding in my simulation, this is pretty much incorrect. Does it uh, answer yeah. your question? Okay. So yes, it's not accurate. It's a single alpha for everything. Yeah. yeah, but I mean that's the only thing that you can do right now for the population synthesis. That's the best thing that you can do. Uh, so even though it's not accurate, I mean that's what we have. Yeah. Any other questions or comments or someone from on my? No, okay, let's thank you again.